Hi, uh, AJ Hartley here, novelist, Shakespeare professor, fan of all kinds of weird and wonderful things. Um, I'm here talking today uh, at some, some Shakespeare questions people have been sending me. I say AJ Hartley, I put as Andrew James Hartley, I am the Robinson Professor of Shakespeare Studies at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. I write mostly uh, scholarship on performance issues and I work as a director and dramaturg, though I'm also currently editing the play, ed editing Julius Caesar for um, Arden Series 4. I just got back from the annual Shakespeare Association of America conference in Jacksonville, Florida. It's not usually there, it just happens to be there this year, uh, where I was um, selling, among other things, I was uh, in, the, in the book room a lot, selling my new book, Burning Shakespeare. Um, so I thought I would uh, field some of the questions that people have been sending me. And again, what I'm going to do today is I'll, I'll answer a couple of them myself quickly, and then I'll give a sort of more extended discussion to somebody else. My guest today will be Paul Menzer from uh, Mary Baldwin University, and he will be talking about authorship. I'm going to get to that in a roundabout way, but first I thought I would I'd tackle a couple of other um, less... Uh, complicated questions. Doug Savitt wrote to me, Doug is a former student of mine, he was a, an excellent puck in a production of Midsummer Night's Dream that I directed about 12 years ago maybe, um, and, um, and he asked what's the use value for performers of original pronunciation? So this speaks to um, the, the the sense that Americans often assume, actually a lot of people assume, that, that modern British English is the way that Shakespeare originally sounded. This is not the case, you know, that the, the English language has been subjected, especially based in, in London, has been subjected to so many different pressures through immigration and um, movements towards different sort of communication styles, uh, that, you know, one of the one things that we can say with certainty is that Shakespeare would struggle to understand most modern British actors today, um, that his own language would have sounded quite different. Sometimes people say that um, the closest analogy is actually something more like Appalachian American dialects, uh, um, because people emigrated from the UK, from England in that period, settled in the US, and then were largely uh, untouched in terms of things that would radically affect their, their, their dialect. That's sort of true. Um, it, you know, it's not like it's the same, that there are, you know, it's one one form of English that, that I think would, would sound a little closer to Shakespeare's English than something like what we call received pronunciation, the BBC English kind of sound that you would expect today. And, and Shakespeare's own language um, would have sounded, you know, a sort of mixture of various less standard dialects. Some of the things that we associated with Northern accents and with West Country accents, um, as, as well as uh, other sounds. And one of the reasons we know this is because we can tell by looking at the plays, for example, where there are certain words that are supposed to rhyme, but in our tongue don't, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the uh, modern British received English tends to be very small and close. You know, the, the, your, your actual mouth movements tend to be quite restricted, right? Um, whereas th these sounds from, from Shakespeare probably would have been much wider and broader. And if I can find a few examples, I'll, I'll insert some into the video. There's a lot of work done on, on this by a father-son team, uh, Ben and David Crystal. Uh, one's a sort of a scholar and the other is more of an actor. Uh, and um, they've done a lot of work at the Globe Theatre in, in London and other places where they have attempted to sort of approximate a version of what they think the original would have sounded like and then use that to inform actors. To bear or not to bear, that is the question. 
whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sad troubles and by opposing end. You, you hear that? To bear, not be, but bear, a say of troubles. And you hear that sort of West Country burr. You hear him say, mind, mind, right? Almost like there's an O in there. That's very West Country. Weather, right? He pronounces the H in weather. You, can, you hear that? Weather. To die, to slay, no more. And by a slave to say we end the heart slave. in a thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consummation to vote me to be washed. You hear that co consummation, right? You hear all those sounds, not just consummation. And before he said slave instead of sleep. To die, to slave, to slip or chance to dream. Aye, there's the rope. For in that. A slip and dream. Dr dream becomes dream. After death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this small coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong. The poor man's continually. The pangs of disprised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that pace and merit are the unworthy takes when he himself might his coitus make with a bare bodkin. Yeah, law instead of law, right? Patient instead of patient. Again, you're hearing all those extra letters. Who would these fathers bear to grunt and sweat in her weary life? Weary. Instead of weary. The threat of something after death. The undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns. Puzzles the will. And makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus, conscience doth make cords of us all. And thus the name. Cords instead of cowards, right? The, in this case, the, it gets contracted. Pure resolution is sickly to her with resolution. a of thought and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard. Their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. It's after now with her affiliate. <laughs> and uh, awry, again, that's, that's that sort of West Country burr, an axion. And when he says country, you know, that, that sort of deep U sound is very northern, you know, as opposed to that sort of more refined country, you know, the sort of elevated, um, tightened O sound that you tend to get in received pronunciation. The Globe particularly, and other places, the Globe particularly has done whole productions using original pronunciation. Now, the first thing to say, of course, is that this is speculative. It's not how it originally sounded, for definite. We, we just don't know this. We can make educated guesses. The other thing, is, so, so what are the pros and cons? The pros, of course, are that it creates, as I said, you know, certain kind of resonances within the line, you know, words that you didn't know. Like, you know, uh, in, in Julius Caesar, for example, Rome and room were almost certainly pronounced the same way. So that there's a constant kind of auditory pun when those two words are juxtaposed against each other, when they're talking about how there's not room enough for Caesar in Rome, that there would have been a sort of a clear kind of punning thing that, that informs the way the argument works, right? So there are those kind of sounds that create an extra level of effect or of meaning that you wouldn't have known from a conventional modern reading. There are also, I think one of the things also is that the language becomes a lot more guttural, a lot more visceral, that it, it doesn't get sort of refined and polite and small. It gets big and sprawling. You know, John Barton talking about cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. Not war, which is very small, but war, which has this sort of more animal kind of sound to it, you know. Um, so the, those kind of things are, I think, uh, really helpful for actors to be alert to, to be aware of, to see if it informs their performance or it informs the way they think about the lines. Because the con, of course, those are the pros, the con, of course, is that Shakespeare is already hard, 
people go to the theater anxious, <laughs> struggling or, or with the sense that they might struggle. And it seems to me that the job of any performance is to communicate in the moment. And there is a potential peril in making the language even less familiar by using old pronunciations, which could be a genuine barrier to understanding, that people might simply not understand what they're hearing. And if they're not understanding what they're hearing, we may as well go home, right? Um, I think, you know, there's more than one kind of theatrical engagement. And one theatrical engagement is something that really explores the original conditions in order from a sort of academic standpoint you know to sort of find what's going on there or what was going on there but in most conventional theater performances the emphasis has got to be on clear communication or as, as, as clear as you can make it you know so i think you know original pronunciation is a double-edged sword if your production if a conventional production becomes archaeological in its uh, emphasis or in its purpose, then I think you're off the rails. You know, I think there are protected spaces where we can do this kind of thing and it's interesting and, you know, productive. But I think for a general audience, this stuff has to be used very sparingly. So I think it's useful to explore, you know, if you're an actor approaching a role and you find yourself running into things, for example, of rhyming words that don't seem to rhyme, you know, and to think about the way that those words might have been originally performed and do a little research to see if that gives you something that you can use, not necessarily in the sound, but in the thought behind the sound. The next question comes from Philip Gregory, um, and he is going to move us towards the, the authorship question. And he asks, the first question that he raised was about Prospero, um, who's the lead figure in the in the Tempest, and um, the the assumption that this is somehow Shakespeare. This is a common idea that Shakespeare was saying goodbye to the theatre, and that this was his final production, his final show, uh, before retiring to Stratford. And Philip was asking whether you know he knew that he was going to die, or whether he was sick, or any of those things. And of course, the the answer is. We don't really know, right? I mean, one of the issues with this period is that a lot of stuff just doesn't get recorded. Um, and the Victorians loved the idea of Shakespeare and Prospero being sort of the same, you know? Uh, and so they particularly pushed for this idea of, of the Tempest as Shakespeare's farewell to the stage. A lot of things have changed since, since the late 19th century, um, however. Not least the way we think about Prospero. Prospero for the Victorians was this sort of benevolent, avuncular um, figure who looked after the island and protected it from bad influences and so on. Um, but in a sort of later days, particularly with an eye to the uh, sort of post-colonial reading of plays like Tempest, there seems to be a... a um, you don't have to read Prospero anywhere near as positively, right? That, that there's, there's things to be critical of in the way that he deals with his daughter, Miranda, the way that he deals with Caliban and Ariel, who are effectively his slaves. Um, Caliban, who claims ownership of the island that Prospero has taken over. Um, and, you know, things about the kind of magic that, that Prospero is doing. People have made arguments that, uh, you know, opening graves and such would have which he talks about, raising the dead, uh, in the original uh, Jacobean period would have been considered marks not just of, of a kind of black magic, you know. So I think that there's a lot of reason to be a, a little bit less enthusiastic about Prospero as a person, which is, a, of course, in keeping with Shakespeare. Most of his characters are flawed. They're problematic. They have issues. There are very few characters who are absolutely simply and straightforwardly wonderful in all things you know um so it, so so part of this is a pushback against that victorian take on prospero as unequivocally a, a good a good guy uh, and shakespeare sort of writing himself right and he has these speeches about 
abandoning his magic, leaving his, uh, drowning his book and leaving the island to return to Milan where he will, where he will die, right? So people saw this as kind of a biographical parallel to Shakespeare returning to Stratford where he would die um, a few years later. Um, well, so that's fine as far as it goes. Uh, part of the problem, of course, is that it looks like the Tempest wasn't Shakespeare's last play. I mean, in terms of dating, we're always a little speculative, but we're talking about 1610, 1611, which puts it around the same time as Winter's Tale and um, Cymbeline, and probably earlier than his late collaborations with John Fletcher, Henry VIII, um, and uh, Two Noble Kinsmen, which are probably 1613, 14 maybe. So it seems like, you know, maybe Shakespeare didn't actually leave right away um, or and certainly not right after the Tempest. So that complicates things a little bit. Um, but, uh, and, and there's no reason to suggest that Shakespeare was sick. You know, he lived for at least a couple of years in Stratford, um, we think, before dying. Uh, we don't know exactly what he died of. There were stories about him uh, drinking with Ben Johnson the night before and then not, not fully recovering. But, I mean, this is just anecdotal stuff which gets accumul which accumulates later. We don't have any good contemporary evidence of, of how Shakespeare came to die or how healthy he was in his final years. He was, you know, fairly old by... by um, early modern standards. So the idea of him retiring from the stage uh, in 1611 or thereabouts, 1613, you know, probably just had as much, to, who knows what was going on in his personal life, but to go back to Stratford and unwind and spend the considerable amount of money that he had made seems to me at least as plausible as anything else. Um, are there elements of the Tempest where he seems to be saying farewell to his art? Yeah. I guess, but it's complicated and it's not, um, it doesn't seem to work with the idea that he simply, you know, wrote that and then walked away because he didn't. So. This is as good a segue as any into the larger conversation about Shakespeare's authorship, right? Because it's the very dodginess, the, 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 the speculative quality of the way that we talk about things like the dating of Shakespeare's plays, because we don't have hard evidence a lot of the time for exactly when they came out. And we have to sort of do work to, to, to identify internal and external evidence that says, yes, this play was written in 1604, or it can't have been written before 1602, or whatever, right? Um, it's because of things like this that there is that it opens up a crack for a certain kind of speculation. And one of the things that people always, always ask me about whenever I do a public lecture, they say, did Shakespeare really write these plays? You know, I, I remember having this conversation with Tom DeLonge, uh, the, one of the first times we spoke. And at the end of the conversation, he's like, so did Shakespeare write these plays? And this is, I always get this, right? And part of the reason is because I think in popular culture, in the, in the wider world, there is this sense that there's this burning academic debate about whether Shakespeare wrote the plays or not. And what people mean by that is, did Shakespeare write them or did somebody else write them? And if answered in very simple terms, then the answer is yes, Shakespeare wrote the plays. And there is no real evidence to suggest otherwise. In fact, nobody seems to have doubted this for a good nearly two and a half centuries, right? Um, it's not something that people start talking about until the 19th century. Uh, in more complex terms, and Paul Menzer is going to get into some of this as he talks in more esoteric terms about authorship, um, the question is also the wrong question, right? Because it assumes that one person wrote all the plays. And if it wasn't Shakespeare the man from Stratford, then it must have been one other person. And that seems not really to be how people wrote in this period, for the most part, with the possible exception of people like Ben Jonson. Um, but for the most part, collaboration seems to have been fairly common. And while Shakespeare seems to be fairly unusual in that he did most of his work by himself, but not all of it. And the plays uh, ev evidence 
you know, other people's hands, right? It was Thomas Hayward who said he had what the most, I can't remember what the line is. He claims to have been involved in like 120 plays, right? Um, not as the lead author necessarily, but as, as a sort of jobbing writer who was sort of coming in and doing bits of stuff or collaborating with other people or doing revisions of plays that had got a little old and needed to be refreshed, right? It's a very different notion of authorship. But um, in, this, in simple terms, there is this sort of, as I said, there's this conception that, you know, academics are really conflicted about this, that they argue about it amongst themselves. And this is simply not the case, right? The plays of Shakespeare for 99% of academics were written by a guy called William Shakespeare from Stratford. And the reason people are perfectly fine with that is because that's where all the evidence points. Um, most of the quote unquote evidence that people have produced more recently to claim that somebody else wrote these plays is internal evidence from the plays themselves where people say, well, such and such a, you know, Polonius, looks like um, Lord Burley, and Shakespeare didn't know Lord Burley very well. Therefore, it must have been written by somebody who knew Lord Burley really well. So it must have been written by the 17th Earl of Oxford. And I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but it really is that kind of argument, you know? And it is thin, to say the very, very least, right? Um, and it leads to all kinds of other Problem. So one of the interesting questions is why do people do this, right? Why do people want to make an issue out of something where there doesn't really seem to be one, okay? Um, and the answer to that, as I said, you know, people don't argue about this until the 19th century, by which time Shakespeare's star has risen, right? He was a very successful playwright in his own day. He made a lot of money, um, but he doesn't become the massive cultural icon for another couple of hundred years. Right? He becomes the sort of flagship of, of a certain notion of English culture and, frankly, British imperialism, something to be exported that shows everybody else how inferior they are. You know? and he becomes the bedrock of education and public libraries, as well as the theater, right? Uh, and all kinds of things that grow out of Shakespeare that we associate with them today don't really start to exist until the 19th century. And this is when people start fighting over who gets to claim Shakespeare for themselves. And it really is very, very personal because frequently the people who were being championed as rival candidates were people to whom the claimant had some kind of family connection, right? You know, um, and often this, the argument is mostly about the fact that people simply don't believe that the, um, for want of a better term, middle class son of a Stratford glove maker with fairly minimal education, though not an unusually small amount of education for the period, a perfectly decent education, but no university education, could have written these plays. That's the argument. So there's a kind of intellectual and social snobbery at the heart of it that says it must have been written by a courtier. It must have been written by Francis Bacon or the Queen or the 17th Earl of Oxford or Christopher Marlowe, who'd been dead, anyway, whatever, or, you know, Huey Lewis and the News. It makes about as much sense. Sorry, I don't have a lot of patience for this. I get annoyed. And partly, the, and, and the reason that I get annoyed is because, you know, it seems symptomatic of a, the culture where we are at the moment where expertise is not particularly valued. Where, you know, if uh, a, a, a mainstream middle brow kind of journal um, or, uh, or magazine wants to run a story about the Shakespeare controversy, the authorship controversy. They don't really ask the right people. They just assume that you can poke around on Wikipedia or whatever and then present this, oh, it's a mystery. It's like, no, it's not a bloody mystery. It's not a mystery. And I hate to say it, but a lot of the people who champion some of the non-Stratfordian, which is what we call it, the non-Stratfordian um, authorship stuff are people on the fringes of academia or simply not in academia at all, who frankly don't know the period that well, you know? So that often they'll make arguments 
that are based on misunderstandings, right? People will say, well, Shakespeare was illiterate because he spelled the documents that we have, you know, he spells his name differently. Everybody spelt their names differently in this period. There was no standardized spelling. And this was a period in which people used things like the way they articulate their name as a claim for a new kind of identity. Anybody who has read any scholarship from like the 1980s onward would understand Renaissance self-fashioning and would therefore be able to put this kind of thing into context because everybody did it. It's all likewise when people say, well, you know, Shakespeare kind of written these uh, plays because he didn't have any books. How do we know he didn't have any books? Well, they're not in the will. You know, it's like, again, if you know anything about Renaissance wills, you would know that they exist as two documents, a testament and an inventory. We very rarely have both the testament, which is a sort of dying man's statement, and the, the inventory, which is simply a list of all his goods for legal purposes to be distributed. We don't have the inventory for Shakespeare's will. And if you have both, you frequently know that there's a huge discrepancy between what the testament speaks about and what actually appears in the will. So did Shakespeare own books? Quite possibly. We don't know. And even if he didn't, does that mean he's illiterate and can't have been a playwright? No, but he just moved to Stratford from London and people didn't own books in the way that we did, that, that we do today. Books were expensive. You know, that he had access to books through his patrons and through people connected to the theatre company. He didn't need to own lots and lots of books. That's a modern invention, you know. So this is what I mean about people who frequently make these kind of arguments just don't know the period that well. And they're sort of cherry picking evidence. Also, if you believe that people like Marlowe or Queen Elizabeth, I mean, come on, Christopher Marlowe dies in 1593. You know, I just said Shakespeare's career, he's writing until like 1613, 1614. Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, dies, I think, in 1604, I want to say. But so if you, if you hitch your wagon to either of these particular horses, you then have to completely restructure the sequencing of um, the way that the plays were written, the order in which they were written, the internal resonances, the, the references to things that are topical. And you then have to come up with this ridiculous, elaborate conspiracy theory nonsense to explain why all of this has been disguised. So these plays were then released, you know, every, every six months or so after the death of my prime candidate. Because, because why? Because it's just nonsense, you know, and people say, well, it's, you know, it, it was considered, uh, uh, you know, writing for the public stage wouldn't be good for an aristocrat. Like, this is not an argument. Plus, he's dead. Who cares? Sorry, I, I, I get annoyed about this. As I say, I get annoyed about it because um, it's about a sort of erosion of of expertise and of truth. And people sometimes say, well, you know, all academics are gonna say this because they're invested in Shakespeare the man. I don't care about Shakespeare the man. I'm a performance guy, right? 90% of the academics that I was just at with in Jacksonville probably wouldn't care if suddenly hard, really good evidence appeared to say Shakespeare did not write these plays, they were written by somebody else. In fact, I think they'd be, a lot of them would be thrilled. They'd be delighted at the prospect of a whole new biographical area to dive into that might generate interesting things about the plays. The, the people just, most academics are interested in the work, unless they are biographers, we're gonna to get to one of those in a second, Unless they're biographers, most of them are not particularly invested in Shakespeare the man, right? They're interested in the work, in the poetry and the plays themselves. Okay, so that's my um, <laughs> uh, not very um, cautious uh, way of leading into a more academically respectable and uh, cerebral conversation about authorship with Today's guest, Paul Manzer. Okay, so let me pull up um, the question that I got. So um, Queen Lapita said, um, ultimately, does it matter if Shakespeare actually wrote all the plays 
attributed to him. And I thought it was an interesting spin on the usual question that we always get about, did Shakespeare actually write these plays? And so I'm coming to you, Paul Menzer, Mary mm -hmm. Baldwin University, and I'm coming to you because I know that you are about to publish, soon hopefully, a new biography of Shakespeare for the Arden Fourth series. And I thought maybe you could help me tackle first the basic question of did Shakespeare write these plays? And then the larger question of does it matter? Yeah, I mean, the second question is, of course, more interesting than the first <laughs> in some ways, right? Uh, so thank you to uh, your respondent for that question. I mean, Shakespeare did write the plays attributed to him, but not by himself, right? I mean, you know, starting with the basics that he had a lot of co-writers, uh, which literary history has actually kind of worked to refine out of the story about his authorship, even you know the first complete works of 1623 attribute all of those works solely and signally, signally, signally to uh, to William Shakespeare. I'm talking about the first folio of 1623, the first sort of complete works of Shakespeare, and there all of those those 37 and 38 plays are all attributed completely and solely to Shakespeare. We know about a third of them at least are were co-written, he had collaborators, right? So there's there's that thing to say. I mean, there is an authorship controversy, just not the one the anti stratfordians think, mm -hmm. by which I mean that by the standards that we think about authorship today as like, you know, somebody with kind of executive control over the text, uh, no William Shakespeare didn't write all the plays attributed to him, right? So, I mean, that's a kind of, a kind of bald answer to the question of did he write them? Um, you know, the sort of more interesting question about does it matter? <clears throat> you know, really, no, um, not particularly. We have the plays that we have, whoever wrote them, and the plays are not diminished or enhanced by attributing one or more authors to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as somebody who just wrote a biography, I give a slightly different answer. It, it does matter if you're writing literary biography and are interested in the ways that a writer's work is shaped and shapes their life. Right. So when you're doing life writing and you're thinking about the creative outputs uh, of an artist, it, it matters as well. And I guess it also matters um, depending on how interested you are in giving credit to somebody for their immense creative labors. Um, you know, to take away the, the works of William Shakespeare from William Shakespeare is in some ways a very aggressive <clears throat> thing to do to another human being. Right. Um, and, you know, to the extent that I could ever let the authorship question get up my nose. It's about diminishing the work of somebody who worked uh, very hard and very long and very well in a particular craft. Mm. And, and that so much of the arguments against Shakespeare, the, the man from Stratford, are, are touched with a particular kind of snobbery, right? The, the, the assumption that somebody of this background could not have done this, therefore it must be the 17th Earl of Oxford or, or, or some <laughs> other aristocratic you know, pretender whose yeah. who's claim, you know, nobody made for 300 years. Right. That's right. And, and you know, I will, I will say the, the way that my sort of thinking about this has evolved through the process of writing a biography. It, you know, of course, I've read a lot of biographies of Shakespeare and a lot of reviews of biography of Shakespeare the last couple of years. And, and uh, James Shapiro, who we can't have this conversation without quoting, probably, James Shapiro in a review talks about like, look, biographies of Shakespeare fall into two camps. I mean, it's a kind of reductive way of thinking about it. Like those who privilege London and those who privilege Stratford in the story of Shakespeare. And I came in my own biography to sort of think pretty deeply about the ways that Stratford really impacted and is so central to Shakespeare's life. It was both the turning and the returning point to which he kept coming back. And, and the reason I bring this up is it's, it, one of the things that has struck me is it's so weird that authorship skeptics kind of travel under their broad banner called anti-Stratfordian, mm. right? It's, it's a strange thing. It's like if you're an atheist, you'd call yourself an anti-Nazarite, mm. right? That like you're focused upon like the place of the writer's birth that, you know, that they won't call themselves anti-Shakespearean, but anti-Stratfordian. Mm. Um, and, you know, there, <laughs> there's a lot of unbelievable things about Stratford, but it is, it is actually there. I mean, it does actually exist. Um, and actually, I know a lot of people who live in Stratford are probably anti-Stratfordian, but in a different way, right? But it's, it's interesting the ways that authorship skepticism um, has really focused upon the, the place of the origin 
And this comes back to your point about a snobbery about, um, about those origins, mm-hmm. right? Because one of the things that's held against Shakespeare is the, the, his unremarkable origins, origins uh, in the Midlands. You know, uh, the, the son of an artisan um, with a grammar school education that probably ended a little bit before it might have uh, run its course, certainly didn't go to university. Um, but then how does he end up sort of being the man of the millennium uh, with those humble origins? You know, the candidacy of the Earl of Oxford, you know, by contrast, um, provides, uh, a, you know, a, a narrative that actually sort of dispels some of the mystery. And maybe that's one of the reasons we don't like uh, the Oxford candidacy in addition to the, can- uh, to the, the snobbery, <clears throat> is it actually provides, you know, the, the Oxford candidacy kind of provides an explanation that dispels some of the mystery of the of the asymmetry or the torque between Shakespeare's unpromising beginnings and his remarkable end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I, th- I think about I think about authorship skepticism a little bit like I mean, it's just a weird thing, right? It's sort of friendly fire within our uh, within our profession. Um, and I've been thinking a lot too about. I mean, look, Shakespeareans don't actually agree on very much, but one of the things we agree on is that uh, the anti sort of Stratfordian movement is lunatic, mm. right? Or driven by conspiracy or snobbery, all these things, all of which I think there's an element of truth to all of those things. But, you know, sort of Shakespeare criticism and scholarship is, is home to all sorts of outre approaches to Shakespeare. You know, you can, you can bring any old thing into Shakespeare's studies and, and make it work. But we are pretty, we, you know, we are gatekeepers when it comes to uh, anti-authorship sort of uh, ideas. You know, that, that's one thing that sort of, that we coalesce around. Well, and, and partly at least because a lot of us are practicing a kind of history and, and it seems like a lot of the anti-Stratfordian arguments are based on bad history. Well, that, I mean, that, that is an excellent point, right? Because yeah, I mean, certainly over the last 25 years, the study of Shakespeare has become and still is largely an historicist endeavor, mm. right? And to the extent that one is or is not a sort of trained historian, Still, any sort of um, any sort of familiarity with the method- methodologies of historicism pretty quickly puts paid to notions of, say, Marlowe or Queen Elizabeth or Bacon or Shakespeare having written these things. It, like the theories really just don't hold up. Or, or the idea that in order to make somebody like the Earl of Oxford work, you have to completely reorganize the canon and move right. everything to, right. to redate it in ways that makes no sense and creates all kinds of logical problems. Well, and, and you know, and for that matter, the kinds of the kinds of cover up and conspiracies that would have had to obtain to make this work. I mean, like, have you met human beings? Do you think people are this organized and competent that you can maintain this kind of cover up conspiracy? Um, Why? Just, Why would <laughs> you do it? It doesn't make sense. It makes no right. sense at all. Right. Right. The, I mean, the other thing, you know, when you were talking about, you know, does it matter? Um, and, and as you know, I'm working on Julius Caesar at the moment. And I, I was saying, I was talking to Peter Holland um, uh, before about, about working on that. And one of the things that I was saying to him was that I found myself constantly talking about Henry V and Hamlet and Macbeth. And it's a, something to do with, I mean, for the, for the Henry V and Hamlet, it's a cluster of where Julius Caesar falls in that sort of 1599 kind of thing and the way that you can see connections to the plays immediately yeah. around it. And then the way you see ideas that Shakespeare has sort of worked with and floated in Julius Caesar that he comes back to six years later in Macbeth, right. say. And, right. and that to me is interesting. And, and in a sense then, then the sort of the sense of a shared authorship matters in that sense, because it's you're looking at the work and seeing an evolution, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's sort of authorship provides coherent, critical explanations for things that might otherwise sort of seem baffling. And so you can see points of continuity and change. And mm-hmm. I don't want to say evolution, but, you know, continuity and change across a canon of plays that we can more or less ascribe to one person does allow us not to chart necessarily artistic development, although that's a piece of it, but, but evolutions of artistic interest and style and form mm-hmm. and craft, right? As you sort of say, I mean, Henry V and Hamlet generically, you don't necessarily think about them in the same categories. You certainly do chronologically for reasons you just said, but thematically, I mean, I think, you know, 
Hamlet is sort of an essay on Henry V in some ways, or vice versa, right? In terms of thinking about, you know, like privileged male subjectivity, blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. and, but as you sort of say, you can make the, the principle of authorship, I guess this is a sort of like Foucault idea or Bart's idea, I can't remember which, right? You know, like the authorship, the author is like the principle of thrift and the proliferation of meaning, right? Like you have all of these works, all these meanings out here, Authorship gives you a way of sort of thinking coherently uh, about things that might sort of seem otherwise incoherent. So authorship provides a model of critical explanation. Let, let me come back to something you said before, because I know that people are going to ask. You said maybe a third of the plays. Are yeah. Authentic. Yeah. So which ones and in what ways? I mean, <laughs> and I realize this is a huge question, but, you know, maybe maybe a few sort of general pointers. Yeah, good, right? Because the, the respectable face of authorship skepticism is attribution work, mm -hmm. right? And attribution work is something that has, that, you know, attribution work, uh, you know, by which we attribute certain plays to certain writers and vice versa, you know, that was stuff that kind of was residing in sort of, you know, the graveyard of literary studies until, of course, the advent of digital humanities and computational stylistics. And so, attribution studies has really perked itself up in the last 10 to 15 or 20 years because we have machines that can read faster than we can uh, and, and detect patterns in a ways that are undetectable to the human eye and brain. So that attribution work is actually um, is taking a deep, hard, long look at the Shakespearean corpus and is, depending upon the day, right, because this stuff is, or and the edition you look at, this stuff is sort of under constant renegotiation. So we think about say a third of those plays uh, having been at least half a second or third or fourth hand in it. We know a play like Titus Andronicus is a co-written work. We imagine that, uh, uh, that, that some or all of the, the sort of one, two and three Henry VI, particularly the first two parts of Henry VI are co-written. We know that a play like Macbeth um, has material in it from Thomas Middleton, but we want to put an asterisk on that, of course, because that's a different form of co-writing, which is, it is revision, probably, right. right? So if we imagine sort of like, we don't, we probably can't imagine like William Shakespeare and Thomas Middleton sitting side by side, finishing one another's sentences or lines. Mm -hmm. It's rather plays like Macbeth, Measure for Measure, probably have been worked over subsequently by another hand or two, so that the versions we have of those plays um, are not entirely by William Shakespeare, mm. right? Um, other plays, you know, we know a lot of, we certainly Pericles, uh, we know to be a collaboration. Um, Henry VIII, Two Noble Kinsmen are collaborations with John Fletcher, um, et cetera, et cetera, right. right? So for certain plays, like you can actually identify or, or computational stylistics will tell us they can identify certain patches, passages or parts that are not by William Shakespeare, right? right. Um, and then, although I think I think a kind of more interesting way of thinking about this is like, you know, as you know, Andrew, I mean, drama is the most collaborative of all literary arts, you know, and so no one ever writes a play by themselves, right? You know, we don't think about Richard Burbage as a co-writer with William Shakespeare, but think the, to the extent that some of Shakespeare's characterization and characters were based and built around the body of Richard Burbage, the voice of Richard Burbage, his histrionic abilities, right? Mm -hmm. Richard Burbage is a co-writer with William Shakespeare, as was the entire company that he wrote for, since he, he enjoyed a kind of unusual duration and stability with a single company, at least from 1594 until the end of his career. So the bodies and the voices and the imaginations and abilities of those men and boys he worked with they put the form and pressure on a lot of these works in the ways that should challenge the way we think about singular authorship. Right, and you see that in that sort of transition in the kind of fools, the clowns that he's writing. <clears throat> you go from yeah. Will, Will Kemp to um, Armin, uh, to Robert Armin. Yeah, Robert Armin. And, you know, you think, I mean, think even about the ways that, that the bodies of the performers left their imprint on the text, mm -hmm. right? Today, we're inclined to think like, oh, we need to, we need to cast Midsummer Night's Dream. And so we need you know, a tall Helena and a short Hermia, right? The idea being like, well, since the text says that Helena is tall and Hermia is short, the bodies of the actors we cast have to be that way. But, you know, I, I would say fairly obviously, when Shakespeare wrote that play, the text took its shape from the bodies of the actors, not the other way around. 
Is the I mean, I'm trying to think, isn't there an inconsistency in the text where it's in, uh, to in As You Like It? In As You Like It, Rosalind and Celia are oh, okay, right, alternatively right. and then simultaneously taller than one another. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, yes. So maybe one of them had a growth spurt. I don't know. <laughs> During <laughs> the production. <laughs> During the production. Yeah. But anyway, it's just a way of thinking about like the ways that the bodies, the voices, and the talents of the actors that Shakespeare was writing with, not for, they're also co-writers to some extent, right. because that's the way that's the way dramatic composition works. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And certainly if you're working in new play development, you know, the, the text is going to change between first reading and opening night, right? I mean, yeah. no reason to think that Shakespeare wasn't doing something similar, but at some point things would change and evolve, particularly, you know, in that sort of, when the play is revived on a monthly basis, yeah, you know, over a period of time that it's going to get tweaked and modified and it's going to, as you say, get added to or, or changed and, and so on later on. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a hack playwright. And so I've sat in the rehearsal room a couple times while plays that, 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 that I punitively wrote were being rehearsed. And you quickly realize how unimportant you are to the process, A. Uh, I always think of it, it's like being a eunuch at a brothel. <laughs> you know, just like uh, you, you just don't fit in. Um, but I, but I've, but I've, you know, I've certainly like sat through moments where, like, you know, there's some long speech that I've written, and I'm just sort of sitting there bathing in my own prose, and the director turns and says, I think we'll just cut. We'll cut. <laughs> right, right. You know, we'll cut that out. Yeah. And you, you quickly understand it's like, yeah, I mean, the text is going to be reshaped uh, and remade by the by the process. And then you're talking about revivals where, yeah. you know, new material is being sifted in, old material is being cut out, topicalities are being updated, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in this weird way, it's like thinking about the hypnotic allure of authorship around a play is a funny place for this anxiety to land. Right. And I think that, you know, when we said a lot of these authorship controversies don't come up until much later, and it does seem to me that that's not an accident, that it's a different notion of authorship and a notion of authorship that comes not from drama, but from the development of the 19th century novel in which the sole creator has become the sort of the authorizing, mystifying you know, source of true art, right? In that's right, because you, you can't have authorship controversies until you invent authorship. Um, and until you move from a sort of a polytheistic idea of making to a monotheistic one and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the author as, you know, it's like the theology of the exemplary individual, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, you know, sort of the godhead of authorship. And so then you can, then you can start being a skeptic um, in your faith about authorship, but you need to invent the God first. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Excellent. It's interesting. I remember, uh, this, this will date me, um, I remember Martin Amos, the sort of, you know, comic novelist, among, among other things, you know, sort of, you know well, a well-published um, novelist. I remember him doing a reading at the Folger Shakespeare Library. This is like back when I was a, 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 a stripling. Um, this was back in the 90s. And he was reading, he read this sort of hilarious short story, which isn't sort of the point, but like afterwards, I remember like there was a Q&A, right? And he got the kind of the question that sort of celebrity authors always get, which is a sort of version if you're an actor when they ask you afterwards, like, how did you memorize all those lines? And, or like, did you really kiss? You know, there's sort of expected questions. And, but Amos got this question was like, who do you think is the greatest writer of all time? And so, I mean, I guess, you know, he was at the Folgers, so maybe he was just being polite, but he said, you know, <laughs> William Shakespeare and everybody was like, oh, huzzah, that's of course. And then he said, what, he said, what a joke. <laughs> and everybody was like very uneasy about that. And it took me, I mean, I was like 20 when I heard him say this and I kind of didn't get it, but I thought about that a lot. And I think what he was sort of saying is like, you know how easy it is to write a play? Try writing a novel, <laughs> right? Let's, you know, basically he was saying like, let's see Shakespeare write a novel. Let's see Shakespeare be Martin Amos, said Martin Amos, <laughs> right? I, and so, but, but I think like, I was like, yeah, there's something to that right? The world's greatest author as a playwright, that is a kind of a literary irony mm -hmm. of sorts, because it is so collaborative. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, all, all plays are incomplete because they're waiting to be completed by performance. This is, I mean, Andrew, you're a novelist, so I'm out of my depth here, but like, I, I know that the sort of the model of authorship as like, 
one with sort of singular executive control over every aspect of it is a fantasy too, because there's editors and readers and proofreaders and so forth. But it's a different model of creation. Mm. Yeah, you know? absolutely. You know, there's just a different level of control over the reception that a novelist has versus a, a playwright. Yeah, I mean, I feel that when I write, you know, screenplays or something that I can work on the script for weeks or months or whatever, but at the end, I don't really have anything. <laughs> I have the yeah. beginning of something that may become something if a large number of people with a huge amount of money decide right. to yeah. make it into something. What I have is a gesture towards an art object. <laughs> if I write a novel, even if it's just a file on my computer, it's a novel, it's done. Right. You know, yeah. and I, can, I can send it to you and you can read it. And it's like, yeah, it's a novel. It doesn't have to be printed. It doesn't have to be anything. But as, a, as an entity, it's complete. It has ontological status <laughs> in a way that a screenplay does not. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah I, can't, I can't believe you said ontological before noon on a Thursday. <laughs> it's impressive. But, you know, it is, I mean, sorry, I think it's one of, the, one of the things that we're sort of circling here, which is kind of interesting, is to think about the, the irony of an authorship controversy around a playwright. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, and, th and that is related, I mean, I guess in some ways that's, I mean, in some ways like having an authorship controversy, just as the way like the, the, the biblical apocrypha creates canonicity, like having an authorship controversy also creates and constitutes authorship in a way. That's the fanciest postmodern move I'm going to take, I'm going to make today, <laughs> like, is like, you know, the, the Shakespeare actually, or Shakespeareans, like, should maybe be grateful for the anti-Stratfordian thing, because it actually does sort of create authorship in a way by having its skeptics. <laughs> I, I, before I let you go, I'm going to throw a curveball at you, and, okay. and it's related to exactly what we've been talking about, because one of the other questions that, that uh, a number of people have asked is, favorite Shakespeare movies? So favorite give, Shakespeare movies. Yeah, movies, adaptations of Shakespeare. And I'm taking a long time to ask this question to give you a chance to think of your top three. And mm. this is obviously non-definitive, but yeah. um, I'm just, I'm curious as to if, if a student asked you, which are your favorite Shakespeare films, what would you say and how would you justify the decision? Oh, wow. Well. well, I think I would, I mean, as I try to think of a couple others, I'll start with Kurosawa's Ron, which is a, 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 an amazing sort of Japanese version of King Lear um, that is really just like an extraordinary cinematic experience, regardless of what it does or does not have to do with, with William Shakespeare. I mean, it's just like, you know, a fantastic piece of art made by a fantastic filmmaker. Um, and I would say in some ways, like closely followed up by his Throne of Blood, which is his, his Macbeth version. I mean, it's just like, you know, fantastically like <laughs> ripping, exciting pieces of filmmaking. I'm laughing because so far you're saying the exact same thing that Peter Holland said. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so let me, so now you're having said that I have to try to, I have to try to sort of um, throw, throw a curveball back at you. You know, I would sort of say for me, sort of like tied for third would be, I mean, I really like Orson Welles' Macbeth. Um, as well, um, which has some qualities I really appreciate, not least Orson Welles, who I just think is a really interesting cat, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, not to put too fine a point upon it. You know, I also, I mean, maybe this is my art, my minority interest, I don't know, in terms of sort of like an adaptation, you know, Gus Van Sant's My Own Private Idaho, mm. um, it's a really interesting film from, oh, help me, Andrew, 50, like the 1990s, probably. Is it not, if it's 90s, it's early 90s. Early 90s. Well, my own private Idaho, which is a really interesting. Not late movie. 80s? It could be late 80s. Could I'll, well be. I'll check. Could well be. But my own private Idaho has a kind of interestingly kind of in like interpolated section about sort of like that's drawn from sort of the Falstaff uh, how materials, largely based, uh, largely drawn from one Henry IV. So that's that's a little bit of an adaptation, but it's also a film that I that really made a big mark on me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think I'll stick there. I will say in terms of adaptations, a play I'm really interested. In right now because I'm working on Richard the uh, Third uh, for Cambridge, a new edition of it. There's a there's a play from a few years ago called Teenage Dick, and it's it is yeah. you know it's as a lot of plays and films have done, it kind of resets a Shakespearean drama within the world of the American high school. Mm -hmm. um, 
because I think the closest thing to sort of the infighting and the snarkiness of the Elizabethan court is the American high school with its sort of internecine rivalries and, and snobbery and, and, and horrifying behavior. Um, but Teenage Dick kind of reimagines Richard III as a 16 year, 16 year old boy with cerebral palsy and thinks about um, the bullying he receives um, in that regard, but does some really, really interesting things about disability and accommodations. And it's just like a, a scabrous and, and funny play. So I'm really interested in that as a Shakespearean adaptation, which is relatively new to me. I yeah, yeah. I, I, and and there've been a couple of decent Richard III, more conventional movies as yeah. well. But the, yeah, the Olivia yeah. still stands up in certain respects. I Absolutely. actually really like the Richard Longcrane one with uh, McKellen. Yeah. Um, which yeah. is one of the more genuinely cinematic adaptations. Of, yeah, yeah. Shakespeare, you know. Well, and also thinking about Richard III films and spinoffs, there's, there's, <laughs> there's, you know, The Goodbye Girl, a film from uh, maybe the 70s where Richard Dreyfuss uh, is an actor who's been charged to play uh, Richard III and he's very excited to do this. And then upon his, his first day of rehearsals, the director says like, now stay with me here, I have a concept, Richard, is a flaming homosexual. And just the film is worth it just for the look on Richard Dreyfus's face. <laughs> uh, there's that. It, and then it reminds me of the, there's a moment in, um, you know, Galaxy Quest? Not as, oh yeah, I do. With uh, uh, Alan Rickman. And he's right. sort of, yeah. the, who plays the sort of Vulcan type figure on this old TV show that is now defunct. And yeah. he's constantly referring to the fact that he used to play Richard III. As the sort of the mark of his theatrical yeah. prowess. Yeah. So it's <laughs> well, as we're thinking about sort of a hilarious sort of film spinoffs, there's also the tall guy uh, mm. with Jeff Goldblum, mm. where he's a, he's an actor, and he gets, there's various sort of misadventures. He plays Rowan Atkinson's smart, uh, uh, what's the word, sort of uh, fall guy, basically. Like, <clears throat> and he one of the things he's <laughs> one of the things he's up for is is a is to get to play Richard in a musical adaptation called Dirty Dick, um, which featuring the song, I've got a hunch, I'm gonna be king. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you sort of see where my sense of humor falls. Um, okay. those, are, those are sort of filmic Shakespearean adaptations that sort of uh, answers two questions with one. Excellent. And on that note, I will let you go. Thank you. Well, I always Thank like to end on I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's always appropriate to end on a puerile adolescent note with me. So. <laughs> and that's it. Um, so as ever, please like, comment, subscribe. If you have other questions about Shakespeare, please send them to me. I guess I will continue to do some of these if people are actually watching them. It doesn't seem like many people are. Um, so, but I will try to get through the questions that have already been sent to me. And if you have something that you really want to talk about, then let me know. Um, I haven't done much music lately because I just, I don't know, haven't seen a lot of new stuff that I really want to talk about. Um, but yes, uh, please check out my uh, Patreon page. The description is in the link. And if you have not already done so, pick up a copy of Burning Shakespeare. Um, and uh, I hope you like it. All right. And uh, until next time, cheers. And I'll talk to you soon.